To those who work and live intimately with the job of drilling wells, drilling mud, that brown colored liquid we see in the pits or tanks, is often taken for granted because it's always an integral part of the job at hand. But for sure, it's a special kind of mud with special kinds of properties, properties that are determined by various kinds of tests. Sometimes, because it undergoes so many tests, it's even referred to as mud with a college education. A study of drilling mud shows that it is closely associated with chemistry, math, and physics. It has even advanced to the point where the name mud no longer fits its character. Drilling fluid is more appropriate, but it's still mud to those who work with it in the field. Once thought of as only a means of carrying formation cuttings from the bottom of the hole to the surface for disposal at the shale shaker, most of today's drilling fluids take on additional jobs, many equally or more important than that of transporting cuttings out of the hole. For instance, it delivers hydraulic horsepower to the bit to help with hole penetration. To get drilling fluid to the bottom of the hole, the fluid is first picked from the suction pit and suction line by the mud pump. The pump sends it under pressure through the standpipe, rotary hose, swivel, kelly, and down the drill stem to the bit. At the bit, the drilling fluid moves upward in the annular space between the drill stem and wall of the hole, reaches the surface, and goes through the return line and over the shale shaker where the cuttings are removed and channeled to the reserve pit at lower left. The mud falls into the settling pit, And once again, the mud pump picks up the drilling fluid from the suction pit and pumps it up the standpipe at right, down through the rotary hose, into the swivel, and down the drill stem. As the drilling fluid is pumped through the surface piping and down the drill stem, some of the pressure is lost. As shown in the circle at right, the pipe walls are rough and create friction and turbulence that accounts for some of the loss of pressure. Other factors are the depth of the hole, hole geometry, properties of the fluid, such as weight and viscosity, and the volume of the fluid. Ideally, the drilling fluid leaves the drill stem through the bit jets in excess of 225 feet per second, or 68.6 .6 meters per second, to strike the bottom of the hole and do work. The work done by a fluid stream is referred to as hydraulic horsepower expended. A hydraulics program is considered a good one if 50% or more of the available hydraulic horsepower put out by the pump is expended at the bit to dislodge cuttings and get them out from under the bit so they won't be redrilled. Redrilling cuttings reduces the penetration of the bit teeth into the uncut virgin formation on the bottom. The work of dislodging the cuttings is not as easy as simply washing them away. First, as labeled at right, the weight of the drilling fluid in the hole, or hydrostatic pressure, is usually kept higher than the pore pressure, the pressure existing in the minute openings in the formation. The higher hydrostatic pressure is indicated by the heavier black arrows on both sides of the hole and on the bottom. The lighter black arrows indicate the lower pore pressure. This higher hydrostatic pressure tends to hold the chips made by the bit on bottom. However, the bit jets overcome the holding force of the hydrostatic pressure. The jets force drilling fluid into the fractures made by the bit teeth. As a result, the chips are lifted up and carried away. Now let's stop a minute or two and emphasize a few points that we have covered. We traced the circulating system from the pumps to the bottom of the hole, and in doing so, covered two major functions of a rotary drilling fluid. The first was that it transmits hydraulic horsepower to the bit to do work. However, on its way to bottom, 
a large percent of the hydraulic horsepower is lost. And if 50% of the available hydraulic horsepower reaches bottom, it is considered a good hydraulic program. Secondly, the jet stream cleans the bottom of the hole to maintain a fast penetration rate. To do an adequate job, the fluid jet must strike bottom at 225 feet per second, or 68.6 .6 meters per second, or more. Enter the fractured formation, lift the cuttings off bottom, and carry them away. Once the drilling fluid leaves the drill bit, does a U-turn, and starts up the annulus, the space between the drill stem and wall of the hole, we begin to encounter additional jobs that drilling fluid does. Since we have been talking about cuttings removal, let's continue with that. If we could cut a wedge-shaped window out of the formation next to the hole, this is what we might see. Drilling fluid moving up the hole carrying chips of rock with it. However, rock chips fall or slip through fluid columns that are static or not moving. And chips fall faster through a thin fluid than through a thick, viscous fluid. Of course, if the fluid is solidified or gelled, the chips would slip very little, if at all. In any case, to get the cuttings to the surface, the drilling fluid has to move upward faster than the chips slip downward. Luckily, True drilling muds are shear thinning fluids. That is, the faster a mud is pumped, the thinner or less viscous it is. And the slower a mud is pumped, the thicker or more viscous it is. This curve depicts this viscosity velocity relationship. Along the bottom, from left to right, is the increase in the pump output or velocity in gallons per minute. Along the vertical axis at left, from bottom to top, is the increase in the viscosity, or the thickness. Note at bottom, at 300 gallons per minute, the mud viscosity is relatively low. Then, as the pump output decreases to the left to 150 gallons per minute, the mud viscosity gets higher. This indicates that the high annular flow rates, or velocities, of true drilling fluids are not needed for hole cleaning since the increased viscosity of the slower pumping rates aids in chip carrying capacity. Generally, annular velocities should be kept low enough to keep the fluid out of turbulent flow. In the hole, the flow profile of a true drilling fluid changes as the flow rate increases. Stage one, at bottom, is the flow profile where there is no flow. In stage two, as pressure is applied, the fluid moves in plug flow, having a fairly flat crest and moving much like toothpaste that is squeezed from a tube. As the flow rate increases, as at stage three, there is a transition zone where the crest becomes more rounded. In stage four, the fluid enters streamline or laminar flow, having a bullet-shaped flow profile. As the flow rate is further increased, the fluid starts to swirl and tumble and enters stage five, which is a flat flow profile and is undesirable since it causes hole erosion, hole enlargement, and higher annular pressure loss. Streamline or laminar flow in the annulus is the most desirable because it effectively removes cuttings without hole damage. Laminar flow resembles telescopic layers of fluid where the central layers move much faster than those closer to the walls of the hole and pipe. The telescopic cylinders of fluid slipping by each other at different velocities do, however, cause some problems. A cutting caught in the center moves very fast, but if the cutting is forced to the side of the hole where the velocity is lower, then the cutting may slip downward. The particle falls or slips until turbulence, or faster shear rates, such as those opposite a tool joint, as at lower right, again forces it back into the faster flow. Cuttings alongside the drill pipe are slung back into a region of higher velocity because of the rotation and whipping effect of the drill pipe. This is the reason why it is easier to clean the hole with the drill stem rotating. If there is difficulty in cleaning the hole, 
To obtain more efficient cuttings removal, one, increase annular fluid velocity, if too low, by increasing pump speed, compounding pumps, or by changing hole geometry. Two, change the flow pattern of the fluid by altering flow properties, or increase viscosity by adding a viscosifier. Now for a gathering of a few more points. This section was devoted to the third major function of a drilling fluid, that of transporting cuttings out of the hole for disposal. It was pointed out that the efficiency of the fluid to carry cuttings depends on the fluid velocity and viscosity, and that a true drilling fluid is a shear thinning fluid that thickens at low velocities and thins at high velocities. Also, it was pointed out that the most desirable velocity to use is the one that results in a streamline or laminar flow. Finally, we stated that the fluid velocity and viscosity can be adjusted separately for more efficient cuttings removal. Under some circumstances, considerable heat may be generated by downhole friction, and some tool joints, collars, and bits come out of the hole with a bluish color on them, indicating that they have been subjected to friction heat that reached at least 750 to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, or 400 to 540 degrees centigrade. Drilling fluids tend to act as coolants at these hot spots by conducting the heat away and transmitting it to the atmosphere at the surface. To decrease downhole friction, lubricants may be used. Here, an extreme pressure lubricant is being added to the drilling fluid at the mixing hopper. Other lubricants, such as oil, emulsifying agents, detergents, and graphite, are also used. Reduced friction shows up as decreased rotary torque, increased bit life, reduced pump pressure requirements, and so on. Another characteristic of a true drilling fluid is demonstrated by a test made on the drilling fluid at the rig site. It shows that when drilling fluid is forced against a porous permeable material, such as filter paper, a certain percent of the liquid phase passes through the paper, leaving behind a cake that is more or less impermeable. That is, the cake resists fluid being pushed through it. As in the surface test, there is a pressure differential down hole. Note the solid black arrows inside the hole indicating greater fluid column pressure and the outline arrows outside the hole indicating lower formation pressure. The greater pressure of the fluid column forces the liquid part of the mud, the filtrate, shown in blue, into the openings of porous permeable formations. Also, the smaller solid particles of mud are forced into the formations. These solid particles eventually close the pore openings and a mud or filter cake, labeled at lower left, is deposited on the walls of the hole. With the pore opening closed, little or no more filtrate gets into the formations. The thickness of the cake deposited depends on the formation. As labeled at upper right, a formation of low porosity and permeability means the cake is thin. Conversely, as labeled at lower right, a formation with greater porosity and permeability means the cake is thicker. Also, cake thickness depends on the quality and composition of the cake. A thick wall cake, shown here opposite the drill collars, labeled at lower left, causes drag, sticking, or swabbing during trips, and can be the result of poor drilling fluid filtration properties. These poor properties could be due to poor particle size distribution, that is, by not having the right size or type of solids in the fluid. Additions of bentonitic clay or organic filtration control agents can improve the cake's quality and composition by plugging the tiny holes in the poorly formed wall cake. Having a good wall cake on permeable formations has its advantages. It minimizes formation damage, affecting both formation evaluation and production. It improves hole stability by avoiding wall-stuck pipe, swabbing, and pressure surges. And it reduces loss of the liquid phase of the drilling fluid to the formations, 
thus reducing the cost of constantly replacing the liquid and its soluble contents. Now let's go back to the surface. Here we see that the kelly has been drilled down and we're going to have to add another joint of pipe before we can drill any deeper. But before the driller shuts down the pump so the connection can be made, he circulates a few minutes without making hole. Why? Well, the answer is that salt water is being used as a drilling fluid, and he wants the cuttings circulated up the hole so that there won't be time for them to fall back to bottom and pile up around the bit, collars, and on the bottom of the hole, possibly sticking the drill stem while the connection is being made. As stated before, one of the factors that affect the slip or settling rate of cuttings is viscosity, and viscosity of water is low, meaning that the fluid is thin and doesn't have the ability to maintain cuttings in suspension when circulation is interrupted. In comparison, a true drilling mud, like in the beaker at right, contains special clay solids that hydrate or take up water. This results in a thicker fluid that has more viscosity than water alone. The degree of viscosity depends upon how many clay solids are present in the fluid and the amount of hydration that occurs. Further, if circulation of a true drilling mud is stopped, gelation takes place. The mud sets up or becomes a semi-solid, which locks the cuttings and mud weighting material in suspension to prevent settling. Consequently, the addition of mud-making clays to water or other drilling fluids helps in suspending drilling cuttings and weighting materials in the hole while trips are being made. A characteristic of clay-type drilling fluid is that the gel structure can be broken and converted back to liquid form when pump pressure is applied to start circulation. Naturally, the cuttings will be loosened and start out of the hole with the mud. At the surface, the mud must release the cuttings to avoid being circulated down the hole again. The separation of some of the drilled solids and cuttings from the drilling fluid is accomplished by the shaker screen. This is the first method of removing solids. Some solids, too fine to be screened out by the shaker, can be settled out in the settling pit by having low gel strength mud. Still finer sized solids are removed by desanders and the cone shaped desilters shown at the top of the picture. Any entrained air or gas in the mud can be removed by the orange degasser in the foreground. Once again, let's pause to reinforce the main points of this presentation. There have been four of them, making a total of seven functions of a rotary drilling fluid that we have covered so far. In this last four, it was pointed out that a drilling fluid cools and lubricates the bit and drill stem, lines the hole with cake, thereby reducing fluid loss to formations, and thus reduces contamination, sloughing, and caving. A true drilling fluid thickens or gels when circulation is stopped and suspends cuttings sand and weighting materials to keep them from falling back down the hole to stick the drill stem. Upon resumption of circulation, the gel thins and allows the sand and cuttings to be separated out at the shale shaker and pits. Have you ever thought about what makes a boat float on water? It's because the volume of water displaced by the hull, the shaded area, weighs the same as the boat and its contents. Drilling fluid acts the same way on the drill stem and casing, even though they may have fluid on the inside. The walls of the pipe, tool joints, and collars displace a given amount of mud, making them weigh less in fluid than in air. This buoyancy is especially helpful when heavy strings of casing are run and the casing is only partially filled. In this manner, the casing can be literally floated into the hole without putting much load on the mast or derrick. The amount of buoyance applied per cross-sectional unit of the drill stem or casing depends on the gravity of the drilling fluids. The density or weight of a drilling fluid depends upon the kind of liquid used and the materials added to it. Excluding air, gas, mist, foam, or aerated muds, the lightest drilling fluid is an oil mud weighing about 7.6 pounds per gallon 
or 0.91 kilograms per liter. In comparison, fresh water weighs 8.33 pounds per gallon, or one kilogram per liter. Some muds made with common mud-making materials can weigh in excess of 19.3 pounds per gallon, or 2.3 kilograms per liter. We are most interested in drilling fluid density because its weight can be used to hold in place, or at least balance, the formation pressures that would otherwise invade the well bore and cause the well to blow out of control. As an example, let's say we have a hole 10,000 feet deep, or 3,048 meters deep, that is full of drilling mud. Let's also say that the mud column's weight at center is such that it exerts 4,650 pounds per square inch, or 327 kilograms per square centimeter, at the bottom of the hole. Notice, too, at bottom left, the normal formation pressure is also 4,650 psi, or, at bottom right, 327 kilograms per square centimeter. So, in this example, the mud column's weight exactly balances the formation pressure. Now, we've told you that this mud column exerts 4,650 psi, or 327 kilograms per square centimeter, at the bottom of a 10,000-foot hole, but we did not tell you how we calculated it. To calculate the pressure, we must know what the pressure gradient of the mud is and how it works. To find the pressure gradient for salt water drilling fluid, let's start with the terms we usually use every day, that is, pounds per gallon, pounds per cubic foot, or kilograms per liter. Furthermore, let's assume that we can freeze the salt water drilling fluid into any shape we desire. In this case, we'll freeze three blocks. The first two blocks are exactly one foot deep, and the third one is one meter deep. We'll say that the first is one gallon in volume and weighs nine pounds, the second one cubic foot in volume and weighs 67.3 pounds, and the last one liter in volume and weighs 1.08 kilograms. Now since pressure gradients are expressed in pounds per square inch per foot of depth, or kilograms per square centimeter per meter of depth, we're going to have to find what a foot of salt water, one inch square, weighs, and also what a meter of salt water, one centimeter square, weighs. So let's divide the upper surface of each block into square inches, or square centimeters, whichever is appropriate. Then we'll slice down through each block from top to bottom along the boundary of each square. Now, if we count the number of foot-long or meter-long pieces we've sliced, we'll find that in one block, there are 19.2 pieces. In block two, 144 pieces. And in block three, 10 pieces. We can now divide the weight of each block by the number of pieces in each and come up with the weight of each piece. The weight of the inch-square foot-long piece of nine pound per gallon salt water is 0.468 pounds, or restated in terms most often used in the field, 0.468 pounds per square inch per foot of depth. This figure, then, is the pressure a nine pound per gallon salt water will increase for each foot of depth. The same gradient per foot of depth holds true for the 67.3 pounds per cubic foot block, since the drilling fluid is the same, salt water. The weight of the centimeter square, meter long piece of salt water is 0.108 kilograms per cubic centimeter per meter of depth. As an example of how the pressure gradient is used in a problem, two feet down from the top of the hole, a nine pound per gallon, or a 67.3 pound per cubic foot drilling fluid, exerts a pressure of two times the 0.468 pressure gradient, or 0.936 pounds per square inch. At 10,000 feet down, the pressure exerted would be 10,000 feet times 0.468 or 4,680 pounds per square inch. The same fluid in an equally deep well measured in meters would exert a bottom hole pressure of 328 kilograms per square centimeter. These bottom hole pressures are usually referred to as hydrostatic pressures. Hydro meaning fluid, and static meaning that the fluid is not moving. Of course, drilling fluids of different weights have different pressure gradients. 
The lightest drilling fluid in liquid form, a diesel oil mixture weighing 7.6 pounds per gallon, has a pressure gradient, shown in the last two columns at right, of 0.395 psi per foot of depth, or 0.091 kilograms per square centimeter per meter of depth. The saltwater drilling fluid, weighing 9 pounds per gallon, we have already discussed. A great deal of published technical data is based on 10 pound per gallon mud, which has a pressure gradient of 0.519 psi, usually rounded off to 0.52, or 0.119 kilograms per square centimeter. A barite weighted mud, weighing 19.3 pounds per gallon, has a pressure gradient of 1.003 psi, or 0.231 kilograms per square centimeter. It may be of interest to note here that the 9 pound per gallon salt water drilling fluid exerts approximately the same bottom hole pressure as that found in a normally pressured formation. This is not surprising considering that most formations through which we drill for petroleum were laid down in ocean beds where the salty seawater was entrapped between the grains of the sediment. The pressure gradient of 19.3 pound per gallon mud is considered the average pressure gradient of the overburden, the overburden being the dirt and rock through which the well is drilled. If a drilling fluid of this weight or more is required to hold the formation fluid in check, then it stands to reason that the fluid in the formation is under extreme pressure and is holding the grains of sediment apart, supporting the total overburden. This, of course, is referred to as an abnormally pressured formation. Bottom hole cuttings brought to the surface should be of adequate size, be relatively free of other formation particles, and be as clean as possible of any oil not naturally found in the formation being drilled. In other words, a drilling fluid should provide an environment that allows us to obtain good formation data. The cutting should be large enough to contain sufficient quantities and kinds of fossilized microscopic remains of plants and animals for geological analysis. A drilling fluid that allows caving and hole enlargement contributes to excessive mixing of upper formation particles with bottom hole cuttings that may lead to erroneous information about the formation being drilled. The use of air and gas as a drilling fluid produces cuttings in the form of dust that are very hard to analyze for geological data. Bottom hole cuttings observed under a black light may reveal the presence of hydrocarbons in a bottom hole formation. Hydrocarbons in the cuttings give off a yellowish green fluorescent glow. Consequently, the use of oil as a drilling fluid, or as part of drilling fluid, makes the results of this analysis questionable, even though the added oil is diesel and gives off a different fluorescent glow than that which may be found in the formation. Most electric logs, like this one, used to evaluate the characteristics of uncased formations and the kinds of fluid they contain cannot be operated satisfactorily in a borehole where oil, air, or gas is used as a drilling fluid. Oil, air, or gas do not conduct an electrical current, which is the principle on which an electrical log operates. Logging tools that create an induced current in the formation or that use radioactive materials are best suited for formation analysis in holes where non-conducting drilling fluid is used. In summary then, a good rotary drilling fluid has ten functions. It carries cuttings from the bottom of the hole to the surface for disposal, transmits hydraulic horsepower to the drill bit to clean the bottom of the hole, thereby maintaining maximum penetration rate for a given weight on bottom and rotary speed, and cools and lubricates the bit and drill string walls the hole with an impermeable cake, minimizes any adverse effects, such as sloughing and caving of the walls of the hole that a fluid has on downhole formations, suspends cuttings and weight material when circulation is interrupted, yet readily releases sand and cuttings at the surface, supports part of the weight of the drill string or casing, controls subsurface formation pressures, and helps to obtain good downhole data for formation analysis. 
So you see, mud is very important to rotary drilling. And it is equally important that the drilling fluid characteristics, as discussed here, be maintained so that the drilling fluid can carry out its various functions as intended.